Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. Wow. Well, while I was in Israel this last week, I talked with a, a man who uh, is a teacher. You know what they call a teacher in Israel? They call him rabbi. And he said that Jews and Christians are coming closer together. They're growing close together. And that kind of puzzled me until he explained what he was talking about. Because we have always thought that the stumbling block between Jews receiving Jesus as their Lord and Savior and becoming born again and Christians is that they did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. But in talking with rabbis and Jews, I've come to find out over the years, and it was really, it came together this last week, that that's not their biggest problem if a Jew wants to become born again and move from being a Jew to a part of the church. That's not their biggest problem. Their biggest problem is they believe in one God, the Lord God is one, and they kind of feel that Christians believe in three gods, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that instead of worshiping God, they say every Christian we know, they worship salvation. Because all they talk about is just salvation, getting people saved. When we talk about yud Hey vav Hey, Jehovah God, the Lord God of the universe, the God who created. He said, but we've noticed a trend in Christians. That Christians are coming back to a place where they talk more about the Father. And as I was thinking about today being Father's Day, it made me realize that there was a tremendous relationship between Jesus and his Father. And we don't have the time to do all of this today, but to give you some extra reading, read John 17. And John 17 is what I consider to be the Lord's Prayer. And that's where Jesus is spending a lot of time, an entire chapter, praying and talking with his Father. And he tells everybody through this, us reading it, by us hearing what he said to the Father, he's telling us about how he wants us, the people who believe in him, to be one with him in the same way that he is one with the Father. In fact, he says that. He says, Father, those you have given me, those, the sheep that I have shepherded, I want them to be one with me in the same way that I am one with you so that they, being one with me, will also be one with you. You know, the Scripture, now, now follow me on this. Don't, don't get all religious and turn me off. Just listen. The Scripture says that the reason, there's two different places it talks about why Jesus came to the earth. One of the places says that he came to destroy the works of the devil. You remember that scripture. The Son of Man, the Son of God, was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. And he does want to destroy the works of the devil, and he did it. And he gave us authority to do it. And the works of the devil are sickness and disease, poverty, death. He gave us authority over the all the power of the enemy. Hmm. But another place it says that the reason Jesus came was to reconcile man back to God. In other words, to reconcile means that it's, if something is separated and you bring it back together, it's reconciled. If your checkbook doesn't balance, but you get it to balance, you, you get it in the right order, you reconcile it. Are you following me? You reconcile your account. So Jesus came for the purpose of man had separated himself from God, but Jesus came for the purpose to get us connected back together with God. Now, now follow me. Once again, don't get all religious on me. I want you to listen with the ears of the Holy Spirit. All right? The Scripture does not say that Jesus came to recognize, reconcile us with the Holy Spirit, although the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. It doesn't say that He came to reconcile us to Him, Jesus, 
although he does want us to be one with him, he said in John 17. But he came for the purpose of man having separated himself from God to get us reconnected to the Father. And it's becoming obvious in these last days that as the Holy Spirit gives us more revelation as we come closer to the return of Jesus, that we are having this revelation in the church that we need to connect with Father God. See, now you don't pray, now follow me on this, you don't pray to the Holy Spirit. Now, if you have been praying, dear Holy Spirit, don't feel under condemnation, we all learn and we increase in knowledge and understanding, right? But the Scripture never tells us to pray to the Holy Spirit. The Scripture doesn't tell us to pray to Jesus. The Scripture tells us we pray to the Father in the name of Jesus, that Jesus is our mediator, and the mediator to who? He is the mediator to the Father. So when we pray, it's, dear Father, in the name of Jesus. Now, once again, you can get so caught up in technicality, sometimes you miss the entire point. So I don't want you to get all super technical and run around correcting everybody when they pray. Okay? But the reality is, a lot of people pray, and they'll say, when you were on the cross, or when you died for my sins, and they're talking to Jesus. And I'm not saying it's wrong to talk to Jesus. Don't, don't, get me, don't take this out of context. But I'm just saying, in, in general, when you pray, it's, Father, when your son was on the cross. Because you're, you're praying and talking to the Father. And you're allowed to talk to the Father because of what Jesus did. And he broke down that wall and he made it so that we can step into the Holy of Holies, not because of what we have done, but because of what he has done. Because he shed his blood, because he put his blood on the altar, we now can go to the Father who we did not have access to before. You did not have access to the Father to talk to him until you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And once you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, his blood allows you to pray to the Father in his name. Why is it that when we pray, usually at the beginning or at the end or someplace in the prayer, we say, Father, in the name of Jesus, and then we, we go on. Why is that? Because without Jesus, you have no access to the Father. And let me tell you something. It is the Father who loved you so much that he sent Jesus. Have you ever just stopped and thought about John 3, 16? It says, for God so loved the world. Now, now Jesus is God. We know that. He's a part of God. But it doesn't say that Jesus loved you so much, although he did. But the emphasis is God loved you so much that he sent Jesus. And that part of himself that's God, Jesus, died for your sins so that you could be reconnected with the Father. Now, there's a big deal about fatherhood. This is why... We, as men, as fathers, we are a reflection in our lives and should be a reflection of the way Father God is. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. And I'm going to give you the character of God. Now, if this is the character of God the Father, it should be the character of every father. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, and just ask yourself, men, hey, and don't be judging other men, women. I'm saying that in love. That was supposed to be humor. But, but you know what I'm talking about. We're not talking about pointing your finger at somebody else. But just, men, judge yourself on this. Are you walking in the kind of love that the Father walked in, Father God? Joy? Peace. Now, when I say joy, that doesn't mean you've got to be just a silly person and goofy all the time. 
but it does mean that there, there's got to be joy in your heart. And that joy is evident. You know, Jesus talked about how what was in your heart came out of you. So you have these things. If you're a born-again believer, you, you're not trying to get these things. You've already got them. Men, if you're a born-again believer, these things are in you. You may say, well, I'm, I'm just not a joyful person. Well, that's your fault. But the joy is in you, and if it's not coming out of you, it's because you're holding it back. Maybe you've got resentments. Maybe you've got offenses. Uh, Reverend Ted, he taught on offenses while I was gone. I wonder why he waited till I left to do that. <laughs> but but, <laughs> but I, I heard some of it. I, I watched you on my little iPad for a while. I'll tell you what, that was a great sermon. I'm telling you, it was good. You all need to get a copy of that. But if you're a man and you're walking around and you're all offended, offenses, just being constantly irritable and ticked off at people, that'll keep your joy from coming out. You know, don't, don't go to the Father and say, Father, give me joy. Because the Father's going to say to you, hey, when you became a Christian, I did. What are you doing with it? Peace. You have peace. Long-suffering. And that doesn't mean suffer for a long time. That's just, that's an old English word. Today we would say patience. Do you have patience? <laughs> oh, my goodness. I remember, my, you know, my dad's in heaven right now, and he's looking on. He's a cloud of witnesses right now, so... He'll verify this. But my goodness, my, my dad was just not real strong in that area of patience. I mean, you know, you'd go on vacation, it was like, yeah, there's the big bowl of, tw bowl of twine. You can see that, you know. <laughs> you know, we're, 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 <laughs> we're coming up to Disney World. Watch it as we go by. <laughs> but, you know, I'm not saying that's all bad. But I'm just saying this. You should be patient, man. You can, you can practice patience. Now, that doesn't mean just be slow. Some people say, why are you like this? I'm just being patient. No, no, you're just being slow. Okay. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, verse 23. Gentleness. You know, you can, you can be uh, somebody that's big and tough. This, this week, uh, one of Robbie's good friends is uh, one of the security guys for Kenneth Copeland Ministries, and he was over there with us for a couple weeks. And this guy, I'm telling you, he is, he is big. He has got arms like this, and he stands like this at the back. I mean, he is like security plus, CIA, I'll break your leg security. I'm telling you. And he, he has this look. In fact, there was this one Palestinian vendor that came down the hill over in the Mount of Olives while we were having a lesson there, and he was going to try to do something. And, and so this guy says, take your stuff, go back up the hill. The guy says, but I was trying. He said, I said, take your stuff and go back up the hill. <laughs> and he, he went up. So, but I'll tell you what, he's one of the most tender guys I've ever met in my life. You know, and then he looks over at you and he smiles and winks, you know. You can be big and strong and be tough and still have a soft heart. You can still be gentle, men. It doesn't just, you, you may be, you know, 325 pounds and be able to bench press 400, but the thing is, you can still be gentle. It's kind of cool to be gentle. And self control. What does that mean? That means. Actually, you have been given the ability to control yourself above and beyond what other people try to do. Some people try to control you. But the reality is, is if you let them, it's because you let them. Because the reality is, is as a born-again believer, you have control over yourself. You say, well, no, I don't. Well, that's just because you've decided not to. But you have it. There may be something blocking it once again, but you actually have it. All right. Well, I want to give you real quickly today, because I know that everybody's wanting to take Dad out and buy him a steak dinner and a new Maserati. But uh, so I'll, you know, so we can get down to the car dealership quick. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll try not to take a long time today. But uh, there are characteristics that make a man of God, and what makes a father? You know, the reality is you may be born with all the right equipment. But the reality, that just makes you a male. 
That makes you a male. That doesn't make you a father. And, uh, I mean, having babies, <laughs> having babies doesn't make you a dad. You know, there was a world-class famous musician who died just a few weeks ago. And he got all kinds of accolades. I mean, this guy has awards hanging everywhere. He was one of the best musicians out there. I personally really enjoyed his music. And I, I'm not going to tell you who he was. But I really enjoyed his music over the years. And he died. But he was, he was a great man, a great musician, but he was obviously a lousy father. He had 12 children by 12 different women. And that's not in itself the problem. The problem is, is because of all that he did, he never became a father to any of them. So making children doesn't make you a father. It just makes you a procreator. But you may be a procreator and a father. That's the good news. Yeah, I don't want anyone thinking you can't be a procreator. That was humor, too. All right, a father excels in four areas. Let me give you these four areas real quick. Love, discipline, intimacy, and value. A true father excels in those areas. Love is the example of how you live for others, not how you live for yourself. How you live for others. Instead of being dominated by lusts and desire, And not giving benefit, now follow me on this, this will take a while to think through, but not giving benefit to others at the expense of others. Love is when you actually want somebody else to have something more than you want to have. It doesn't mean you don't want to have it, but you just love somebody else so much. For example, you may be in the, in the smallest sense of the word, you're waiting in line at the post office and you see someone who is behind you in the line and your heart just doesn't want them to have to wait. Now, you know you're going to be waiting in line, but your heart doesn't want... And you step back and you say, no, you, you can go ahead. Now, that's, that's the very simplest one. But when you give somebody else something that you want, but you want them to have it more than you want you to have it, You know, Jesus paid the price so that you could have. He died so that you could live. In fact, he said this. He said, greater love hath no man than this. Then he laid down his life for a friend. Let me ask you this. Will you lay down anything for anybody? If you love, you will. Love is a continual giving process. Love is when you want somebody else to prosper more than you want to prosper. It doesn't mean you don't want to prosper, but you just get a, a joy out of somebody else prospering. I've told this story before, but I only have so many stories. I've only lived one life, you know. Um, but we, we attended a church one time where there was a, a, a prosperity prayer group got together. And they were all praying for prosperity. And everybody in this prayer group needed it. You know what I'm saying? Everybody needed We all needed it pretty, pretty bad. So we got together and we prayed that God would prosper the people in the group. Well, one of the couples in the group started prospering so much that the other people wanted to kick them out of the group. Well, who do they think they are? Got all that money, Rudy, tooty, duty. <laughs> Well, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Love would say, yes, one of us made it. And I'm glad it was them. Instead of, well, what about me? I mean, you ever do that? You go to God, somebody, somebody receives something great from the Lord, somebody really prospers, 
and you go to God and you say, okay, God, I want to know. Why them? What about me? Remember me. I'm the one that went to church. I'm the one that tithed. I'm the one that got up on that snowy morning and drove through the ice to church, dented my car. Remember me? Remember him? He slept in. He watched football on TV, and I went to church. And now there's a blessing coming along. And who gets the blessing? <laughs> I mean, you ever, <laughs> you ever been there? You know, I was like, you jerk. If you really had love, you would be excited that they got blessed. Instead of thinking how much better you are than them and why didn't you bless me? After all, Lord, you know I'm more humble than they are. Okay, love. This is a characteristic of, of a man of God, of a father, love. So, see, I'm, you may say, well, I've never had any children. Well, if you're a man, you're still a man of God. Hey, you can, you can be a father. Now, now, follow me through on this. Don't get weird. I'm not talking multiple marriages or whatever. But you can be a father to someone that's not your son. There's a lot of young men out there that need fathers that don't have one. And you can, you can be an example. You can, you can be that young man's man of God. All right? Number two, one was love, two is discipline. Discipline is the way that you can be an example and show children what to do by example. You can show them the benefits that come from the right decision and the right commitments. You know, without discipline, you will never attain your goals. This can't be something that you decide you're just going to do today because it's Father's Day. Like, hey, it's Father's Day, I'm going to be nice. It's not just something like, no, no, this, this has got to be a lifestyle. It's got to be discipline. See, most people, you know what the Bible says about discipline? It says people being disciplined don't like it. In fact, the scripture says, those whom God loves, he reproves and he disciplines. And then it goes on and says, in the same way that when fathers on earth discipline their children, it doesn't seem joyful but grievous to the child, later it yields a better result. Now, I'm, I'm not an advocate of beating children. But I do feel that a little swat on the butt sometimes of these little ones will straighten them out. Didn't think I was going to say that, did you? But sometimes I just feel like, I, I was at Walmart a few weeks ago, and this lady was teaching her child to count. That's two. And a kid just, I mean, the kid's over there thinking, I wonder how high she can go, because he knows he'll never get the swat. Well, Loretta and I, when we were young, we were the swat team. Whack them and stack them. But you know what? They turned out pretty good, didn't they? You notice when Robbie was up here a while ago, I walked over next to him. He didn't flinch. Because <laughs> he knew I loved him. Ah. Okay. The third thing is intimacy. We develop intimacy through listening communicating, and praying together. And we're talking about fathers here basically today. Have you ever prayed with your children? Do you communicate with your children about the things of God? Or do you just preach to other people and hope your children listen? See, it's, it's really good to talk with your children about the things of God. My daughter has a dream. A scripture that she thinks about. 
she comes to me and she says, Dad, I had a dream. And she knows that what she's not going to get from me is, <laughs> you think, <laughs> no, no. I take, I take what God says to my children seriously. And if God's speaking to them, you know, then that's good. I believe when the Lord returns that we're in a situation where we have four generations on the earth right now. It's never been this way before. But uh, like last night at the wedding, Johnny and April had 15 grandchildren. Well, where's the lights? Are, there he is right there. That's, that's the, the dad. So the dad of the, of the married couple, see? So he's got 15 great-grandchildren. So he had the great-grandchildren, the grandchildren, the children, and the old folks. You know what I'm saying. I just, you know. So, all here together, all ready for the rapture of the church together. Are you following me? So, in this situation, each generation has its differences. Now, his generation, kind of like my generation. Well, see, we have the generation of the World War II, you know, the hero generation. There's a few of them left here. The ones that went off the farms and the cities, and they went to Europe to fight the Nazis. They went to the Pacific. I mean, they were the hero generation. And then you got my generation. They went to Vietnam or Woodstock. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, then, and then you got the next generation, which, I mean, I, staying alive, staying alive, you know? And I'm thinking, I don't get it. I don't know, you know. Disco is not music. It's just an event. Um, but then... But then now we got the young generation, and the, well, what do they call them? Is that the millennials? And I don't know. I love my grandchildren. They're just, just like eclectic. I don't know. But all four generations have got to communicate with each other. And how do you get the, the World War II hero generation, you know, to, to communicate with staying alive, staying alive? I mean, how do you do that? Or Woodstock, you know? <laughs> I don't know. But God knows, and it can be done. And it can be done through discipline and love. And you've got to decide, I want to communicate. You can't just look at the kids today and just say, I don't get it. I mean, honestly, I don't get it. Uh, I was at the airport the other day, and, and this guy, if he would have done something wrong, the police could have caught him so easy because his pants were down to here, you know. And it's the only generation where the... You wear your outer pants and your underpants and you watch them all. You know what I mean? But if the police would have been after him, you know, his crotch was down there between his ankles. and he, you, you know what I mean? If, if, they would have, if they would have tried to catch him, I mean, hey, catch that guy. You ain't catching me. Not catching me. You know? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I don't get it. But I loved him. So, and then value, you know, value is developed when we take our children through the task that establish them and give a sense of accomplishment. I mean, my, my granddaughters, they all do different things, but I'll pick one. Erin, uh, and she's big in soccer. I mean, she is, like, she even practices, how old are you, Erin? How old? 13. And she practices with, like, the varsity. She's in training, getting set up to train with the Olympic thing. You know, this, you know, the Olympics, whatever. But I don't get soccer. I mean, just a whole bunch of people running around out on the field with this ball and they're just all kicking it different directions. I just don't get it. I mean, I like things like 32, 17, hut, hut, you know, I mean, I like that. But this, I don't, but you know what? Because I love her, I pretend that I get it. You know, and I go, to, I go to the games, and I sit there, and I, I cheer. I have to wait till somebody else cheers so I know when to cheer, you know. But, but man, I, because I love her so much, and, and I rejoice in her accomplishments. You know, and, and you need to be there for these kids, right? Well, you know, these four things are what Christ gives the body. 
And it's what I'm supposed to be giving to the congregation here. Hmm. I wrote down some things I want to just read to you in closing here. Um, these are things a man must give his family in order to be a true man of God and to be the father of his family. You don't want to just have a family where you're just the drill sergeant. Hey, get over here. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you may have to say that, but no, you, you want to be a father. Why are there so many gangs in America? Why? There's a lack of fathership. If most of these boys in these gangs had a father, they wouldn't be in the gang. Why are there so many cults in the world today? Why is it people who go off and drink Kool-Aid because somebody says something? It's because they don't have a father image, and they're looking for somebody to be their father. And so, you know what? If they're looking for somebody to be their father, the devil's got a lot of people out there he'll send along to pretend to be their father. Hmm. Men must take the responsibility that God has given them. And there is today in the world a sense of fatherlessness. No one becomes a true man of God just because you're born. You may be born a male, but you become a man by taking responsibility for the choices that you make. Accepting responsibility for bringing a child into this world doesn't mean ruling with an iron arm of steel or becoming a dictator at home. It means becoming an example to a young boy or girl, giving direction for them to follow. You know, you've seen this on bumper stickers before, but they will believe what you do more than they'll believe what you say. Although your words carry power, faith without works is dead. You must have corresponding action you can't tell them not to cheat and then them hear you talking about how you're going to cheat on your taxes. You can't tell them not to steal, but then they watch you walk out of the grocery store where they gave you the wrong change and you get in the car and you say, they gave me back the wrong change. No, you can't talk one thing and not walk it. Kids may be young, but they're not stupid. Wow. Wow. To train is to teach by example. You need to understand this. You may rule and reign over your kids while they're at home, but you cannot make their decisions for them. When your children observe you doing what's right and seeing the result and the peace that comes from you doing what's right, then they are going to want to do what is right. A father must stand behind his words. How many broken promises, words of death. Let me ask you this. How much profanity is in your home? Oh, my goodness, I got another page of notes. Um, be at peace. When you promise your child something, you're making a deposit of your words in them. If you fulfill your promise, you redeem your words. If you don't, the child holds on to those unfulfilled promises and they form layers of hurt and unfulfillment in their life. And then you reach a point where your words mean nothing to them. You've got to be like God. God stands behind his word. You stand behind your words. Your life is constructed by your words. The more you honor and respect God's rules and regulations, the more your children will. I like what Loretta said earlier, and I'll add this to it. We cannot allow our children to hear us complain or dishonor God's command. God's creative power is in his word. 
when God speaks the word, it releases his spirit to bring forth into manifestation what his word has said. When God's word gets into your mouth, it becomes his creative word, not yours. Little children repeat what they hear at home. And as they grow, that continues. A lady sat in my office, waiting at, in the outer room of my office one day, and I was, I was pretty busy with people, and she was waiting out there with her, with her um, actually it was, yeah, with her little daughter. And uh, little daughter was coloring in a coloring book. And so as the people left my office and I walked out, I saw the coloring book and wanting to be the nice guy that I am, dub in some applause. Uh, I went over to the little girl and I said, what are you coloring? And I reached over and just to put my hand on the edge of her coloring book. And she says, you get your blank, blank hands off of my blank, blanking book. Little, that's like a little kid. And the mama says, don't know where she heard that? <laughs> well, she just made it up. No, no, she, she would never say something she hadn't heard. You know, your kids will tell on you. You'd be amazed at how many of your kids have told me stuff. <laughs> Pastor, what's this word mean? Your desire should be to pass on through your mouth God's word so that God's word will get into their ears and then get into their mouth. Here is the number one scripture that I call the rule of fatherhood. It's 1 Corinthians 11.1. One. Let's put this one up on the, on the screen if we could. 1 Corinthians 11.1. One. This is the way it works. Paul said... Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Wow. Imitate me just as I imitate Christ. There's another scripture. Um, I think it's Ephesians 5.1. Angie, can you find Ephesians 5.1 and put that one up and see if I've got the right scripture here? Yeah, there we go. It is up. Therefore, be imitators of of God as dear children. And it goes on to tell us that in the same way that children imitate their parents, we should imitate God. Well, what's that tell us? We're to imitate God, but what's that also tell us? Children imitate their parents. Hmm. You may not have had a good earthly image of what a father is, but when you were birthed into the kingdom of God, you got a new father, a new spiritual father. You became a son of God, and you had the perfect fatherly image. Now, you may be a father sitting out there, and your kids are all messed up because you were a mess. Or your kids may be all messed up, and you weren't a mess. But guilt is not of God. Guilt is not of God. And you know what's in the past? Let me tell you what's in the past. The past. And you know when? You make a change when you decide to. And you change today or whenever you decided to change. And from that point on, it's just like when you got saved and your sins were forgiven. When you repent of being a crummy father, that's all forgiven. And now, today, you be who you're supposed to be today. And if you are who you're supposed to be today, God's fine with that. God's not concerned about the past you've repented of. He's concerned with today. Today is the day the Lord has made. Rejoice and be glad in it. Today is the day of salvation. God is the God of I am. He's not the God of yesterday and he's not the God of tomorrow. He is a now God. Wow. Wow although he is the God of yesterday and tomorrow, because in him there is no time. 
just as the Spirit of Christ will fulfill a woman in her femininity and purposes, that same Spirit, when it comes to, into a man, will make him the man he is supposed to be. All right. We're going to close with one scripture. Actually, it's two, two verses. And it's where we started. Let's go back to Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. We'll put them up on the board here. But the fruit of the Spirit. Now, men, understand this. If you're a born-again believer, first of all, if you're not a born-again believer, get saved today. Because once you decide that Jesus Christ is going to be the Lord of your life, once you make that decision, then old things pass away, all things become new, you're a new creation, and the Spirit of God moves inside of you, and you have this. Now, if you're not born again, you don't have this. But if you're born again, you have this. And if you're born again and have this, then there's no excuse for you not operating in this. It's just you got to get rid of whatever it is, the unforgiveness, the hurt, the, the offense, whatever. Just get rid of it. Just get rid of it. And then this stuff will flow out. It's not a matter of whether you can get love, joy, peace, and patience in you. It's a matter of whether you can break down the barriers to allow the love, joy, and peace that's already in you, to get out. All right. The fruit of the Spirit, this is what you have. You have love. You have joy. You have peace. You have patience. See, even though I'm reading slow, you're not irritated, right? You have patience. You have kindness. You have goodness. Boy, we didn't get a chance to talk about that much, but just being a good person. You know, in, when somebody cuts in front of you at Walmart because they're not looking in their car in the parking lot, instead of you giving them the, you know, telling them that by gestures that they're number one in your life, um, you smile and you understand they were just distracted. Doesn't mean they're an evil person because they pulled out in front of you by accident. Okay? How about just having some goodness in your life? Faithfulness. Gentleness. Self-control. Against such there is no law. You want to be a, a good father? That's what you operate in your family. You want to be a great man of God? That's what you operate in your life. You want your children to love you? You say, well, they don't love me now. Start operating in that, and they will. You say, well, they don't right now. Well, hey, quit it. I said, if you, right now, you start operating in the fruit of the Spirit, and you'll be surprised. You'll have friends you don't even want. <laughs> All right. I'd like the altar ministers to come forward right now. If you're not a born-again believer, if you would like to have this operating in your life, all you've got to do is receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You say, well, how difficult is that? It's not difficult at all because Jesus has already paid the price. All you have to do is just receive what he has done. If you're not a Christian and you'd like to be a Christian and you're watching online, we have several thousand people watching online, or if you would... If you would uh, are in this auditorium and you'd like to become a Christian, all it takes, according to the Word of God, you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that God raised Him from the dead. You confess it with your mouth and you're saved. You say, well, that sounds too simple. God made it simple so that everybody could receive. He's not walking around with a clipboard making it difficult. Jesus has already paid the price in full with his blood. If you're watching or if you're in this auditorium and you'd like to become a Christian right now, if you were to die today, do you know for sure that you would be in heaven tomorrow? Do you know that? If you don't know, you need to know. There is no fear when you know that there is no end to your everlasting life. And you can know that you know that you know right now. You say, well, how do I do it? Believe in your heart, but you repeat outwardly to me. Because the scripture says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth 
and I'm going to guide you in that confession right now. So in this auditorium and online. Dear Heavenly Father, I receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I believe Jesus died for my sins, and I believe you raised him from the dead. I repent of my sins, and I thank you for forgiving me. I will never deny that I'm a Christian. I love you, Father. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now, if you made that confession and you meant it in your heart, then according to the scriptures, you were born again. You are now a believer, a Christian. You're born again. Now, what you need is you need to find yourself a good church, a place that teaches from the Holy Bible, Old and New Testament, not a mosque or a temple, but a church. All right? And you need a Bible, Old and New Testament. If you don't have a Bible, if you can't afford one, send us an email. We'll send you one anywhere in the world absolutely free. Thank you 